Hello. Today we're continuing our series of GCSE Physics Revision, looking at humans and their environmental impact. We start with fossil fuels, such as coal and oil. And the big problem about those are that they have to be burnt in order to produce the heat to uh, drive the uh, turbines, which in turn turn the uh, generators, and that burning of the fossil fuels produces the gas carbon dioxide. And the problem from our point of view is that carbon dioxide is what's called a greenhouse gas. Let's just review what happens in a greenhouse. The point about a greenhouse is that it's usually made of glass, substantially of glass, and the idea is that the sun's light, and more importantly the sun's heat in the form of infrared radiation, is able to get through the glass and into the greenhouse where it warms up the plants. Um, when the plants are warm, they too radiate heat, but the heat that they radiate, the infrared they radiate, is a much longer wavelength, and that can't, or most of it, can't get through the glass. Some of it does but a lot of it is reflected. So in other words, the short wavelength, high frequency infrared radiation from the sun gets through the glass, warms up the contents of the greenhouse, which then re-radiate the heat, but the, the heat that it radiates is much longer wavelength, much lower frequency, and that is not so easy to get through the glass. The glass will simply reflect it, and so the heat stays in the greenhouse which is precisely what you want. Now, the trouble is that if you take the Earth, and here is the Earth's atmosphere, then what happens is that the sun's light, and uh, indeed the sun's heat in the form of infrared radiation, high frequency, short wavelength infrared heats up the Earth. Now the Earth does not want to keep getting heated, so it radiates off its own heat, and that's what cools the Earth down, so that we maintain a sensible and appropriate um, temperature for the Earth, which is good for all the biodiversity on the Earth. The problem with carbon dioxide is that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has the greenhouse effect. In other words, the heat is radiated out of the Earth, where it is absorbed by the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide then re-radiates that, um, that heat. Some of it will go out, but quite a lot of it comes back. And that maintains heat in the uh, Earth, on the Earth's atmosphere, that would otherwise have escaped without that congregation of carbon dioxide. So you've got a greenhouse effect where the temperatures increase. And that leads to global warming. So where you have a significant increase in the uh, production of carbon dioxide, either through the use of widespread use of fossil fuels, or indeed of course petroling cars, burning to produce amongst other things carbon dioxide, you've got an increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and an increase in the extent to which you've got greenhouse gases means that the Earth's atmosphere's temperature will rise. So what might you do about that? Well, one solution is to engage in what's called CCS, which is carbon capture and storage, and that reduces the impact of CO2 by trying to collect the CI2 from the power station as it is being produced and then storing it. Storing gases is quite difficult, but one option, of course, is to store the gas inside the mine from which the fuels were mined. When those mines are exhausted, um, there's a lot of space underground, you can pump the CO2 into that space. Okay, okay some of it might leak, but actually um, it's quite a well-sealed area underground. You seal off the mine and you can contain uh, carbon dioxide under pressure underground. Another product of the fossil fuels burning is sulphur dioxide, SO2 which dissolves in rainwater, water of course being H2O, and I'm not writing the chemical equation because it's a little bit more complicated than this, but essentially sulphur dioxide 
dissolves in water to form H2SO4, and that's a very dilute form of sulfuric acid, and that's called acid rain. And you can also have nitric oxide or nitrous oxide falling into uh, or dissolving into rainwater to form a very dilute solution of nitric acid, and even carbon dioxide can dissolve in water to form a dilute solution of carbonic acid, all of which are a form of acid rain, and that can have a, an impact on particularly vegetation, which may not like acid conditions. There are some plants that like to grow in acid soils, but that does not necessarily mean they like to have acid falling on them. It's a very dilute solution, of course, but nonetheless, it does have acidic properties and that might affect and even destroy vegetation. Then there's the landscape effect, where you have mines uh, those mines will be visible, and people can often complain that those mines are spoiling the views of the countryside. And then you can have the risk of oil spillage, when large ocean-going tankers carry the oil from where it is mined to where it is required. If they encounter, say, they hit a rock or whatever, and the oil spills out, it forms all over the sea. And the point about oil is it is less dense than uh, water, so consequently it will float on the surface of the sea, but it will, this is the point, it spreads out on the surface over a very wide area. So you've got a very thin film of this very viscous, almost treacly-like oil that's come out of the tankers over a wide area of the sea, and when the birds come in to land uh, to do some fishing, they land in this oil, and the oil coats their skin and coats their feathers and their wings, and they can no longer fly. So you can have a serious impact on wildlife where you have an oil spillage. We've already dealt to some extent with the environmental impact of nuclear fuels used in nuclear power stations. First, we have the problem of the storage of nuclear radioactive waste. Some of that radioactive waste may have half-lives of several thousand years, which means in a thousand years' time, there'll still be half of it left. Then we have the issue of decommissioning the power station at the end of its life. Part of it will, of course, be radioactive because it will have been housing radioactive material. So it may take years and cost a lot of money to decommission. And then of course there's the risk of a catastrophe if something goes wrong with the power station or indeed if some of the nuclear fuel is stolen and used to make some form of nuclear weapon. Some people have argued that biofuels are the answer because they are allegedly carbon neutral. In other words, they certainly give off carbon dioxide when you burn them in order to produce the heat to run the generators, but that carbon dioxide they give off will then be absorbed by the new crops that you grow to produce the replenished um, biofuels. But you also have the risk of deforestation where large forests are cut down in order to provide ground on which biofuels can be uh, grown and therefore you lose the biodiversity associated with the forest. Moving away from fossil fuels, there's another series of problems from that which is called CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons. These are materials which have a combination of chlorine, fluorine and carbon. They were used as the um, means by which you got the pressure and therefore the um, uh, the power to squirt hairspray out of a hairspray dispenser. And they, are all, they were also used quite commonly in fridges as a coolant, the means by which heat was transferred from the fridge out to the room. But the problem with CFCs is that they affect the ozone layer. Ozone is a molecule of oxygen which consists of three oxygen atoms as compared to the normal oxygen molecule which has two oxygen atoms, and the point about ozone in the atmosphere is that it helps to protect us against harmful ultraviolet. Here we'll just uh, break off for a moment to talk about what ultraviolet does, 
when it hits you. It can have an impact on your skin. Now, some people would regard a very minor impact is the business of getting a skin tan. Opinion is divided about whether a tan is healthy or unhealthy. A tan is, after all, a modest degrading of your skin, so in that sense it's unhealthy. On the other hand, sitting and relaxing in the sun may, for a modest amount of time, may be a relaxing thing to do, and therefore that helps with the health. But one sensible precaution is to make sure that you, wear, uh, you put on sun cream. Sun cream will have a sun protection factor, SPF. I always use at least 40 because I'm not interested in getting a tan, though strangely um, you still get a tiny bit of a tan even if you put on sun protection factor 40. The number tells you the uh, amount of time um, or the extent of the time that you can stay out in the sun. So if it's sun protection factor 40, it means you can stay in the sun 40 times longer than you could if you weren't wearing the sun cream. So if in the middle of the summer, um, when the sun is at its height, the sunburn time is something like 30 to 45 minutes. In other words, if you stay in the sun uh, without putting anything on or without putting any sun cream on, in the height of the summer in the UK, in 30 to 45 minutes, you will burn. And it, the trouble is it's not immediately obvious after 30 to five, 45 minutes, but later that evening, your skin will go very red and you will feel very uncomfortable in 30 to 45 minutes. What sun protection 40 means is that you can have 40 times as long, so at least 20 hours. And since the day isn't uh, the actual day when the sun is shining doesn't last for 20 hours in the UK, that's pretty much a day's worth. But you must, of course, keep reapplying it during the course of the day, particularly if you've been swimming. Incidentally, ultraviolet sunbeds carry the same kind of risk. There may be a lower risk, but it's still exposing your skin to ultraviolet radiation. So if you are going to use them, you shouldn't use them any longer than recommended. You, you may remember that what we were talking about was ozone in the atmosphere, because ozone absorbs ultraviolet, and ultraviolet can seriously damage your skin, which is why it's a good idea to use some kind of sunscreen um, with a high protection factor. But what we find is that around the Earth, if you look at the Antarctic region, where uh, ozone accumulates, we find that during the course of the winter, the proportion of ozone in the atmosphere will reduce. That's a natural phenomena. But what has been discovered is that in recent years, the proportion of ozone in the atmosphere above Antarctica has reduced to very small levels indeed. And that kind of manifests itself as a hole in the ozone layer. That's where the idea of a hole in the ozone layer comes from, that the actual proportion of ozone in the atmosphere reduces to very low levels, so it appears that there's nothing there at all. Consequently, there's nothing to absorb the harmful ultraviolet rays that would be coming through. And it has largely been felt that this is a consequence of CFCs, which have a damaging effect on ozone in the atmosphere, the consequence of that is that CFCs have now been largely banned and other substances which do similar work have replaced them. Finally, you will notice that I have not said in this video the extent to which the human impact has impacted on global warming. And that is because that is not for me to do. In a couple of videos time, I will be making a video about the scientific method. And what I will be saying to you, and I assume most of my viewers are budding scientists, is you need to make up your own mind on the basis of the evidence, not on the basis of hysteria or what other people may say. You are scientists. Get the evidence, look at it, make up your own mind. Of course, global warming and indeed whole of global atmospheric conditions can be affected by natural phenomena. After all, in the past, the Earth has gone through ice ages. It's not as though humans have always been responsible for climate change. But where there is climate change, where there is global warming, it's for you to determine how much and the extent to which that is uh, that, that, that human, humans are responsible for it. 
And for that, I suggest you try to get hold of evidence and make up your own mind to decide for yourselves rather than being told what to think. This is one of those situations where you can do your own personal assessment, which is why I'm not going to tell you what my own views are.